Hey, I'm Huck. And if you've been watching this, this series started off three videos ago with my asserting that some members of the Supreme Court are more concerned with advancing their far-right ideology than they are with upholding the Constitution. Conservatives on the court, I said, are a joke. In this, the final video of the series, I will lay out the case for why every justice on the Supreme Court, liberal and conservative alike, have no choice but to uphold the Affordable Care Act as constitutional, at least if they plan on using the Constitution as their guide. I will show that the case law supporting the Affordable Care Act go as far back as the very framers of our Constitution, the very first Congress of the United States, and our very first President, George Washington. I will also show you in this video how consistently decisions by the Supreme Court of the United States, both past and present, undermine virtually every argument opponents use to challenge the constitutionality of Obamacare and how some of those court opinions were written not by liberal court justices, but by some of the most conservative justices sitting on the court today. But don't just take my word for it. Hear the evidence for yourself and come to your own conclusion. Conservatives will deny it, but the facts are what they are. And the facts are that the basis for the Republican attacks on Obamacare like Republican attacks on virtually every other initiative by the Democratic president and members of Congress, was formulated in an evening meeting on the very day President Obama took his oath of office on January 20th, 2009. On that evening, just hours after the new president had taken his oath of office, Conservative Republican members of Congress, including Eric Cantor, Paul Ryan, Tom Coburn, Jim DeMint, John Kyle, and even Newt Gingrich, met in the Congressional Caucus Room, licking their wounds from the ass-kicking they received at the hands of Democrats that election day. Forget any honeymoon for the newly elected president. Not gonna happen. The Republicans were absolutely livid that they not only lost the presidency to the Democrat, but lost 21 House seats to the Democratic Party, as well as eight Senate seats. The Democrats now had a majority in each House of Congress and their leader in the White House. At that closed door secret meeting, the Republicans on hand formulated a plan of unprecedented obstructionism for the new president. They would wield a unified Republican response of no to each and every new initiative launched by the Democratic president or Democrats in Congress. Their priority was all about assuring failure of the newly elected president and the newly elected Democratic majorities in Congress. Republicans were determined to deny the new president and Democratic members of Congress any chance whatsoever to succeed. We've got to challenge them on every single bill, said House member Kevin McCarthy at that meeting, and so they did. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, a plan originally designed by Republicans and pursued by Republicans for more than 20 years became just one of hundreds of democratically sponsored, democratically supported bills in Congress that not a single Republican voted for. Overcoming this formidable obstacle, Obamacare went on to become the signature achievement of the new president and the Democratic Congress. And so, Republicans launched an all-out assault on the new law the moment it was enacted. In all, 26 Republican state attorneys general challenged 
Obamacare in the courts. In a previous video, Obamacare, the real reason Republicans hate it, I revealed how the opposition to Obamacare had absolutely nothing to do with its constitutionality or any perceived threat over the perceived loss of individual liberty. And that's one prevalent argument used by the opponents of Obamacare, that somehow this law represents an infringement on individual liberties. Yet Congress has taken much more coercive steps at infringing on our individual liberties, mandating, for instance, that we must, when called upon, engage in the military and engage in battle at the risk of our own lives, that as parents we must immunize our children, that as businessmen we must pay a minimum wage and adhere to certain health and safety requirements of our labor force, that we as individuals must pay toward our future health care and pension needs by contributing to Medicare and Social Security, that car manufacturers must equip their products with certain emissions and passenger safety equipment at whatever cost. As far back as 1792, Congress enacted a law that required all able-bodied men to buy firearms. Seventeen framers of our Constitution helped pass that bill in Congress, and it was signed into law by our first president, George Washington. And each of these laws, those that were disputed at least, were found to be constitutional by the Supreme Court according to the Commerce Clause, the Proper and Necessary Clause, and other relevant passages of the Constitution. Some of these rulings dating back as far as the late 1800s. The Supreme Court members are not stupid. They are aware that this fight is motivated by politics, not constitutional issues. Even the most conservative members of our Supreme Court are aware that even those Republicans who are most vocally fighting the Affordable Care Act were in fact vocally supportive of an identical bill up to the moment it was enacted into law by a Democratic President and a Democratic Congress. A measure of just how insincere the Republican opposition to Obamacare really is, can be demonstrated by the unanimous Republican support for the Paul Ryan House budget bill. In that bill, the voucher system that Ryan substitutes for Medicare uses many of the very same components found in Obamacare, including the mandated use of privately run health care exchanges run by each state. So while Republicans cry that Obamacare is unconstitutional, they are at the same time unanimously in support of a Medicare substitution that uses many of the very same provisions. And you can be sure that the Supreme Court is also aware of this inconsistency. But so much for the politics. Let's look at the constitutional arguments opponents are raising. It's worth noting that prior to the Supreme Court hearing oral arguments in this case back in March, the general consensus, even among the most conservative judicial scholars, was that this was a hands-down win for the administration. Few, if any, constitutional experts argued that this law could be thrown out on any constitutional issue. Those voices of reason included such conservative stalwarts as President Reagan's Solicitor General, Charles Freed, Lawrence Silberman, Jeffrey Sutton, and J. Harv Wilkinson III, along with conservative Columbia Law School constitutional scholar, Henry Paul Monahan. All of them concluding that the mandate and every other provision within the Affordable Care Act is indisputably constitutional. But all of this consensus seemed to change after the justices on the Supreme Court took six hours over three days to hear oral arguments presented in the case. 
Now, most knowledgeable court observers note that one cannot really make judgments based on oral arguments heard in the case. Yet, after oral arguments were heard in this case, the so-called experts were giving Obamacare no better than a 50-50 chance of being upheld. So now, many believe that at least four justices, Scalia, Thomas, Alito, and Roberts, are very likely to vote to overturn Obamacare, while the four more liberal judges, Breyer, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan, are most likely going to vote to uphold the law. That leaves one justice, Justice Kennedy, as the swing vote, who typically votes with the conservatives approximately 70% of the time. Many court observers initially believed that Scalia would also vote to uphold Obamacare. This stemming from several court opinions Scalia authored involving the Commerce Clause, most notably a case called Gonzalez versus Raich. But more on that in a moment. There had been a lot of speculation that Chief Justice John Roberts might be persuaded to uphold the law, not based on its constitutional merits, but rather the fact that a another conservative narrow 5-4 decision could negatively impact the court's historic legacy. Of course, the whole constitutionality question stems from how one interprets the Commerce Clause in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. As far back as 1790 and 1791, and with virtually every passing decade since, the court is taking an increasingly expansive view of allowing Congress to regulate businesses and commerce, particularly in areas where states have been unable to effectively do so on their own. Many far-right conservatives see the Commerce Clause as very restrictive, allowing states to determine the commerce conducted within their borders, with very little power of the federal government to override that authority. Opponents of Obamacare, and conservatives in general, like to cite the events of the 1930s, when, during the Great Depression, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt threatened to stack the court with liberal justices if conservatives on the court didn't quit overturning and blocking legislation Congress was passing to protect unions and create Social Security. Since then, conservatives say it's been liberals on the court who have continued to empower the federal government at the expense of states' rights. The problem with that theory, of course, is that it's been both liberals and conservatives who have sought to further federal authority. The problem, it seems, is that conservatives these days have moved their ideology so far to the right that even conservatives of a decade or two ago, Reagan, for instance, seems liberal in comparison. This is why most constitutional experts felt that Justice Scalia was certain to uphold Obamacare based on his writings in the Gonzalez v. Raich case, for instance, where he argues that even non-commercial actions under certain circumstances fall under the regulatory powers of Congress. Well, this is central to the opponent's argument that the Affordable Care Act's individual mandate is a violation of the Commerce Clause. Clearly, Scalia would not see it that way. In essence, the chief constitutional question at the heart of this case is whether the federal government can compel an individual, business, or person to purchase a health insurance policy they would otherwise choose not to buy. Justice Scalia wrote in the Raich case, and I quote, that Congress may regulate even non-economic local activity if that regulation is a necessary part of a more general regulation of interstate commerce. That puts Scalia 
at odds with the law's opponents who claim that by not engaging in the purchase of health care insurance, the Commerce Clause gives Congress no authority to force those people to engage in an activity. Justice Kennedy, it turns out, joined the opinion of Justice John Paul Stevens in an even more sweeping approval of congressional authority on these matters. And in U.S. versus Comstock, Chief Justice John Roberts in 2009 concurred with an opinion written by Justice Stephen Breyer that affirmed Congress's authority to, and I quote, use any means that is rationally related to the implementation of a constitutionally enumerated power. So you might ask, what exactly happened during oral arguments in this case that suddenly has so many people believing that Justices Scalia, Roberts, and Kennedy are likely to reverse their positions on constitutional interpretations of the Commerce Clause in order to overturn Obamacare. Personally, I came away from those oral arguments with a somewhat different perception. Justices on the court typically play devil's advocate when peppering the attorneys on either side of the case with questions during oral arguments. Often, this means that the justices will ask the most pointed questions, at times even the most ludicrous questions, of those attorneys representing the side of the issue they tend to be in most agreement with. After all, if you feel you are pretty close to already having made up your mind on a case, the best questions to ask would be those that challenge your reasoning rather than questions that would tend to reinforce it. So my overall impressions are that two justices, Thomas and Alito, are almost certain to vote against Obamacare. No surprise there. Scalia, too, seemed to be eager to overturn Obamacare, but it will take a contortionist to twist his reasoning in a way that fits with his previous rulings on related law. Assuming that the four more liberal justices on the court vote to uphold the law, this leaves Justices Kennedy and Chief Justice John Robert as the key players in this drama. And at the center of this case is something that Justice Kennedy brought up in oral arguments that were echoed with some rather absurd analogies by Justices Scalia and Alito. And that is, if the government can compel people to purchase health insurance against their will, what stops the federal government from compelling people to purchase other products or services they also deem necessary or beneficial? What, if anything, Kennedy asked, can be used as the limiting principle to restrict federal authority. My impression was that Justices Scalia and Alito embarrassed themselves when they used as examples broccoli and burials, asking whether or not the federal government could one day compel people to purchase these because they deemed them necessary or beneficial. Essentially, the answer to such silly questions is that broccoli and burials will come into play when they become facets of commerce that lead to bankruptcy by individuals, employers, and states so cost-burdened trying to purchase them. When broccoli and burials become virtually impossible to regulate at the state level because people who are obtaining them without purchasing them are passing on thousands of dollars of added costs to those who do purchase them. When broccoli and burials become a matter of life and death with costs so high that insurance is required to offset that cost. But when insurance for broccoli or burials are denied to those people most in need of them. And finally, when broccoli and burials make up as much as one-sixth of our nation's gross domestic product. Maybe then it will be time to take a look at burials and broccoli in the same light. 
And until then, maybe Justices Scalia and Alito can think of a more relevant question to ask. The point is, the whole case against the Affordable Care Act rests on an assumption that the Commerce Clause somehow restricts Congress's authority to mandate the purchase of a product, no matter how universal that product is, no matter how beneficial that product is, regardless of how poorly regulated that product is, no matter how inaccessible and unaffordable that product is, while being regulated solely by individual states. The truth is, the exact opposite is true. It seems irrefutable that the fair access and affordability of something as critical as health care in America was exactly the type of problem the Commerce Clause was designed to resolve. Which brings us to Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia's absurdist originalist views on the Constitution and how that fails to relate to the real world we live in today. None of our founding fathers, I reckon, could possibly have imagined health care evolving to its present state. At the time of its writing, the state of the art in medicine was to bleed patients for whatever mysterious illness they seemed to suffer from. More often than not, patients were as likely to die from the bleeding process as they were from the illness itself. At best, the practice hastened death. This was a time when healthcare services were often bartered for. If you couldn't pay cash, a few dozen eggs, a few homemade pies, whatever you could spare from your farm or garden. Our founding fathers probably couldn't conceive of a time when a medical procedure might cost more than a man's annual salary or even many times the total value of all of his property and possessions. Yet, just one year after enacting the Constitution, the year would have been 1790, Congress enacted a law that compelled businesses to insure all men employed at sea. In 1798, this law was amended to force individual seamen to insure themselves. Both of these laws were signed into law by then President George Washington. Moreover, as many as 20 individuals who helped draft and approve the Constitution later served in Congress and enacted this law. More importantly, the delegates who sat down and drafted and approved our Constitution asked themselves the very same questions as are involved in this very case. Just how far does congressional authority go in overriding the desires of individuals and the authority of individual states? They clearly stated their intentions with a resolution they passed while creating the document we now hold as sacred. That resolution states that Congress should have the authority, and I quote, to legislate in all cases for the general interest of the Union, and also in those to which the states are separately incompetent, or in which the harmony of the United States may be interrupted by the exercise of individual legislation. It really couldn't be much more clear that the Commerce Clause was designed and intended to allow Congress authority to address the most pressing issues of the day, particularly those issues that states individually or even collectively were unable to address effectively themselves. Radical conservatives have always railed at the idea that any congressional authority not specifically enumerated within the Constitution is invalid. And this is a, an argument that was waged as early as 1791, just two years after the Constitution was written, when those who wrote it were actually enacting the laws of the land. In 1791, Congress enacted a law establishing the first national bank. Congress argued that this bank was required in order to borrow, to pay war debts, and to levy taxes. Founding Father Alexander Hamilton 
argued strenuously for this expanded meaning of the Constitution's Commerce Clause and got his way. However the court ultimately decides the Affordable Care Act, we can reasonably assume one thing for certain. You will hear no mention or reference to Alexander Hamilton or the First National Bank of the United States by Justices Scalia and Thomas in their opinions on the case. Likewise, you won't hear any discussion of Congress enacting a health care mandate on men employed at sea both in the year 1790 and 1798. Still, with all of the concern about conservatives on the court making another unconstitutional decision, there is reason for hope here that at least Justices Kennedy and even Justice John Roberts may yet see the light. When Roberts noted in oral arguments that there seemed to be a unique nature connecting health care insurance and health care services, not found in other forms of commerce, well, that certainly leads to speculation that at the very least, Roberts might be straddling the fence on the issue. But it may be Justice Kennedy's remarks that ultimately become the most crucial in deciding the case. Kennedy has always been a strong advocate for individual liberties. However, he's equally known for his positions on individual responsibility. It was Kennedy who asked Solicitor General Donald Verrilli Jr. whether or not there was some limiting principle that could guide the court in future cases where government sought to assert its authority to compel people to do something or purchase something they really had no desire to buy. In effect, Kennedy answered his own questions during a moment late in the proceedings when he addressed one of the plaintiff attorneys, a gentleman by the name of Michael Cardiff. His statement to attorney Michael Cardiff was, and I quote, the young person who is uninsured is uniquely, proximately, very close to affecting the rates of insurance and the cost of providing medical care in a way that is not true in other industries. That's my concern in this case, he said. To this, interestingly, Cardiff responded, and I quote, I may be understanding you, Justice Kennedy. I sure hope I'm not. Kennedy had answered his own limiting principle question. He seemed to recognize that health care and health care insurance are indelibly linked, that the inability or refusal of some to access or afford health care insurance places a burden on the costs of both health care service and health care insurance of everyone else. It is estimated that the cost of unpaid medical bills in this country total about $43 billion annually, a cost that is passed on to us in increased costs for the medical services received. And it's estimated that it adds at least $1,000 to the cost of every insurance policy sold. Clearly, Justice Kennedy saw this as an inability of states to regulate both health care and health care insurance effectively. Interestingly, the plaintiffs in the case conceded that Congress does have the authority to implement a Medicare for All program if they should choose to, and even conceded the point that had the Affordable Care Act used the word tax rather than the word penalty, for those who were non-compliant on the individual mandate question, that the law would most likely constitutionally stand. If we were to take this argument at face value, then are we to believe that the whole case hinges on simple semantics, that the word tax substituted for the word penalty would be all this fuss is all about? The decision, when announced in June, promised is to shape more than just the future of health care in America, its accessibility and affordability. It will go a very long way in determining just what role and power 
Congress has, at least for this generation of Americans, in recognizing, examining, and ultimately resolving the most pressing dilemmas of our time. Your guess is as good as mine on how the court will ultimately rule in this case. But I'm going to put my money, which is certainly not enough to buy me a health insurance policy, on the idea that Justice Kennedy will in fact vote against the conservatives on the court and go ahead and uphold the Affordable Care Act. But it's just a guess. And if he does, I would not be a bit surprised to see Chief Justice John Roberts go along with him for a 6-3 decision affirming the Affordable Care Act. But with Roberts, nothing would really surprise me. Whichever way this decision goes, I really do look forward to reading whatever concurring or most likely dissenting opinions that are written by Justices Thomas and Scalia. They are almost sure to bring me a laugh for the sheer parody of legal reasoning their opinions generally represent. I'm Huck. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you soon.